it looks like. Um, and then we here talked about representing the outputs of the retinas kind of binary uh, configurations. And we uh, wanted to build maximum entropy models. So let me see if that, oh, it's kind of a very, oh, it's like multiple mouse pointer. Now, if you double click, it will make it full screen. Eh? Oh. Double click on the screen. No. I mean, I have it on full screen here, so I don't know why. Right. Um, so what what we are going to focus on is is describing the probability distribution over over these activity patterns um, in in a neural recording, uh, and for that we'll use maximum entropy models in order to uh, address this curse of dimensionality. Oh, yeah, much better. Mouse. This mouse. Sorry. Okay. Good. Well. All right. Okay. Um, right. And so. This is now a rehash, since I gave you uh, the background yesterday, this is simply a, a rehash, right? So we have a, a bunch of samples here. I denote them by this sigma i, like spin variables. Um, and I want to build a distribution from the finite number of samples with using the maximum entropy method. And now just going very quickly through what we said yes, uh, yesterday, I, I'll build maximum entropy uh, models by choosing some functions that I'll discuss of, of these binary configurations. These are functions f mu, uh, same notation as yesterday. Um, I will compute their average values evaluated over my experimental data, if you want, over the training data. So these are these expectations here. And then I'll construct, and we derive this form, I'll construct a probability distribution here where the functions are um, here in the exponent is a kind of linear combination of constraints. And I, you know, to fit them all, I need to find this G mu, right? The Lagrange multipliers such that the model matches the constraints. And, you know, and this has been done in, in the field of neural code analysis um, using various cho choices of these constraints functions. So if, if my only constraints are individual neural activities, then you know I'm getting an independent model as we described yesterday. So it's a maximum entropy model. The only thing it constrains is the firing rate or the average activity of every neuron and no correlations. So it's a kind of a trivial factorial model. Uh, the next one is the one we also introduced yesterday. It's a kind of a pairwise Ising-like model where I constrain the mean activity of every neuron and the correlation coefficient between every pair of neurons, okay, I and J. But I will introduce today more complicated models as well. Um, and yesterday I tried to show you a hierarchy where you constrain first order marginals, second order marginals, third order marginals, and so on. But that's not the only path forward. Um, in this data, we'll see that it doesn't make sense to constrain the third order and fourth order, whatever margins, which are also sampled more and more, you know, poorly, even finite data. Um, so these are the references that I've looked at this model, sorry. Um, you, can, you can do various alternatives. So for instance, you can construct, you can constrain pairwise correlations between pairs of neurons, but also constrain the activity of each individual neuron conditional on some external variable. In this case, it could be stimulus because the stimulus is playing, right? So this is not a number. It's sort of if you want a function, right? It's it's like a, a, a activity of neuron I given whatever is the stimulus. Um, I won't discuss this one today. Uh, you can constrain something that's that we call a K spike statistics is basically a synchrony. So so if I have a bunch of neurons, imagine I have hundred neurons at every point in time, I can sum their activity. So at one point in time, 57 out of 100 are active. The next point in time, 29 out of 100 are active and so on. And then what I can constrain is the expectation value of this quantity, which is nothing else but the probability that zero of them are active, the probability that one of them is active, whichever one, the probability that two of them are active. So it's constraining the synchrony, right? The joint activation. And it's a, for, like from physics side, this is a bit of a weird variable, kind of it's a global variable that I'm constraining, right? That's perfectly fine within the context of max and models. Um, and you know, the thing that I'll show you, and it will become more understandable, this I'll show you and motivate today is it's a kind of a specialization of this pairwise model. So you constrain the mean activity of every neuron, you constrain all the pairs, and you constrain this global synchrony, how many of them how many of neurons independent of their identity are jointly co-active 
in, in each time bin. So again, this is, right, MaxAnt is a framework. You can build it using various types of constraints that are motivated by the problem that you're looking at. Okay, so let me give, let me start by this, uh, this reference, which kind of uh, sparked a renewed interest in MaxAnt for neural code analysis. So what was the big deal that uh, Schneidman, uh, Schneidman and all did? So they looked at very small subgroups of neurons, like 10 neurons, okay? Um, and it has been known in neural coding for quite a while that if you record simultaneously from pairs of neurons, be it in the retina or be it in the cortex, uh, this, this is qualitatively, it will be the same. So if you record from many pairs and measure the correlation coefficient between any pair of neurons, and you choose many pairs, and you look at what these correlation coefficients are, this is a distribution of correlation coefficient, your, your normal correlation coefficient, okay, Pearson correlation between minus one and one. You will typically see something that looks like this. So it's a histogram where the values are really very small, okay, between pairs, typically, right? I mean, there is like some 0, 0.0, like, you know, the, maybe, maybe the median of these distributions is 0, 0.0, I don't know, three or something like that. You know, there's some pairs that go to correlation coefficient 0, 0.1. You know, maybe there is something 0, 0.2, but typically the values are small for any pair that you choose to record. And the interpretation of that finding in many works prior to this one that I'll, that I'll uh, allude to is that, you know, pairwise effects, correlation effects are small. Maybe we can model these neurons as essentially being independent. Okay, you can neglect these things. Now, if you test for st statistical significance, these correlations were significant. We have a lot of data. We can estimate them very well. There's a lot of samples in my neural recording. So the question is not, you know, whether they're significant or not. Most of them are, but they're all small, okay? Uh, so, you know, the, the idea for, for quite a long while is that perhaps they can be neglected. Um, but then uh, what, what this, you know, what Elad Schneidman, Bill Bialik, and other colleagues have done in 2006 is they said, but well, let's take them seriously and let's build these maximum entropy models for a small group of neurons, let's say 10 neurons together, that constrains the mean firing rate of every neuron and the pairwise correlations, you know, which come from this distribution, so small values, but essentially all pairs are significantly correlated. That's what you also find out if you look at the data with these small correlation coefficients. Okay, so they build this type of model, which now you're familiar with, kind of a pairwise Ising-like model. And this was sort of the striking result of that paper. So let me explain it for you. This is very important, okay? So each dot in, in this plane corresponds to a particular joint configuration of 10 neurons. Okay, so for instance, this dot here corresponds to the first neuron firing, and then, you know, nothing, you know, all of them silent and the ninth neuron fires and the stent is silent. So this is a particular configuration, okay? Now this configuration and, you know, each dot is one such combination. And many of these configurations, if you only look at 10 neurons, happen sufficiently many times in the data that you can just estimate their probability by counting. So they repeat because the number of neurons is small. There is, you know, 2000, sorry, 1024 possible patterns and you have hundreds of thousands of samples in your data. So you can just count. Okay, so on this axis, on the x axis, there is the frequency, empirical frequency of each such combinatorial pattern of activity. Okay, now on the y axis, there is two things one is in blue, one is in red. In blue, there is a model of neurons that are independent, so you neglect that and say they're not correlated. So, this is a so for each binary word, you can estimate the probability of it. Simply, it's a product probability, right? How, what's the probability of the first guy firing, given its firing rate of the second guy and so on. So that's a model that neglects correlations. And the red is this model, the Ising pairwise model that actually takes seriously this, even though small correlations, right? And what you see is that, of course, this line is the equality line where the observed pattern frequency is actually equal to the model pattern frequency. Now you see for these very low frequencies, there is a spread. That's simply because these, these are the patterns that even in your data, which is large, are poorly empirically sampled because they only happen a few times, right? And these two towards the right are, are patterns that happen many times. But what you note is this drastic failure of the independent model. I mean, this is a log scale, okay? So this means there are patterns like this one that is highlighted where independent model mispredicts its frequency by orders of magnitude, okay? 
And so the, you know, the, the statement of that paper, I mean, it makes other statements, but, but the statement of the paper is independent model is a failure, even though every individual pairwise correlation coefficient is small, but together many weak pairwise correlation coefficients leads to large collective effects, meaning large shifts in the joint pattern of activity, in this case of, of 10 neurons, right? So pairwise correlations are weak, but their collective effects, uh, effects are strong already for these small groups of neurons. And for these small groups of neurons, you have two advantages, okay? As, as I said, one advantage is you can actually just empirically sample the probability uh, by counting. This will, of course, not be true any longer when you go from 10 neurons to 100 neurons, which we'll do next, okay? But the other advantage is also that for groups of 10 neurons, uh, the solution of the pairwise max end problem uh, is exact. So you can still solve it exactly because with 10 neurons, the partition function, the Z, is a, you know, is a function over 1,024 states. You can just enumerate and solve everything explicitly. No Monte Carlo, no approximation. So you can make sure that you've done your job you know, without like technical difficulties. Okay, so that was a, kind of the motivation. And then a lot of analysis of neural code you know, took off following this particular paper. <clears throat> and so what you know, I was kind of part of, 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 this, of this group. And of course, the first idea, uh, I mean, the first thing that we wanted to do afterwards is to scale this up to larger groups of neurons to say, because the recordings were just coming online where you could record simultaneously from 100 plus neurons simultaneously, right? And so, you know, what I'm going to be showing you is, a, is an analysis of, a, of this fish movie clip, like the fish swimming around that you saw. Uh, which can be repeated exactly 300 times to the retina. Uh, it's kind of a 20 second movie clip. And then the recording is from 160 neurons. And, you know, we, we are essentially, when we binarize, as you see, we get about 300,000 samples in the data, you know, of, of like configurations. And so now, uh, if you want to build models, not for 10 neurons, but for, you know, up to, so in this case, we build models up to 120 coupled neurons. Uh, you know, there is no more possibility that you empirically sample anything, right? I mean, the state space is two to 120. So, you know, that's off limits. And also you can no longer exactly solve the maximum entropy problem because you would have to sum this partition sums over this state space. So you need to solve it, solve the problem um, with Monte Carlo methods and, and so on. And so we build two types of models. We build the same one that I showed you for the small group, pairwise Ising. Okay, uh, and I'll show you how it works. And then we generalize it to this K pairwise, so meaning uh, max and model that constrains the means, the correlations, and this joint synchrony statistic. And you will see why we did this last bit. Okay, so that's, you know, pairwise model constraints N mean firing rates and N choose two covariance elements. And so here is how the thing looks like. On the left, in the left column, you have what's measured. So this is now a 100 by 100 covariant or well, correlation coefficient matrix. In this case, why is it read up? Is because the neurons have been sorted by their firing rate. So it's, and then there is some correlation between the firing rate and the correlations. So that's why there's thread here. So you measure the uh, correlation coefficients. The next little plot is you measure the av average activity of individual neurons. So this is now in spin variables, meaning minus one would be if the neurons are totally silent all the time, plus one if they're all the, way, all the time firing. And you know the fact that they're negative is because neurons are like, they like to be silent most of the time. So most of the time they don't spike in many of the time bins. Okay, so they're closer to silence. And again, if you look at the distribution of this correlation coefficient, same thing I've showed you before from the 2006 paper. So high peak, close to zero, very, very small values, significant, but small, okay? So these are inputs. And now, of course, I'm skipping all the technical details, but these inputs are sufficient statistic for the pairwise maximum entropy, Ising-like model. And from them, you reconstruct the matrix of couplings, JIJ. So these are now Ising-like couplings between pairs of neurons and individual biases or magnetic fields, if you want to think about them, that act on these neurons. And these two things exactly reproduce these two measured things, okay? And now, you know, for those of you who might have statistical physics background and, or maybe spin glass background, you would be immediately tempted to look at the distribution of this JIJ in the matrix, right? This is that kind of disorder, if you want. 
And you would observe that this JIJ, and here there are distributions for you know, groups of 10 neurons, 20, 60, 100, and so on. These distributions kind of look like Gaussian centered on zero positive and negative values. It's frustration. And you know, we also were extremely enthusiastic and say, oh, it's like a spin glass model, et cetera. Turns out the story is much more complicated and it's not like SK spin glass and, and so on, but, but you see it's not an easy type of Ising, okay? Everything's coupled with everything and it, you know, the couplings are diverse, positive, negative, uh, and so on. And there is frustration in this if you look at triangles and so on. So potentially something interesting. Um, yes, and one can check. One can do test train, one can check, one doesn't overfit and so on. I'm not showing this, but it, it all works out, it's fine. Um, now, you have this pairwise model, okay? And you can, you can ask this model now, right? It's a pairwise model, meaning it's as random as possible. It only reproduces the covariance and the means, nothing else, right? And so now you can ask the model to predict some higher order statistic that you did not put in because you only put in covariance and means, right? And so one statistic is this distribution of synchrony that I want to show you as a function of the size of the network, right? Because we have, we recorded 160 neurons and so we can build models for subgroups of 10 or for subgroups of 20, for 50, whatever, right? So here is how this synchrony looks like. And let me parse this out for you. So this is for a group of 10 neurons. So, you know, you can have either in a group of 10 neurons, all of them can be silent. So that's K equals zero. And the probability of all being silent is here. And then, you know, one of them can be active, which is here, or five of them can be active synchronously. And this is the probability over the whole data set that K of them are simultaneously active. So the data is the red line. It's very, you know, sharply decreasing. The independent model, which is a failure, so we know the independent model doesn't work, right? Because it doesn't get the collective stuff right. It's this. And the pairwise model is the, is the black line. And, you know, here for the groups of 10 neurons, as in the nature paper, this, you can quantify the agreement and it's quite okay. But as you go to higher and higher number of neurons, I'd say this is a group of 100 neurons, Right, you start seeing a substantial deviation between the data, which is the red thing, and the pairwise model, which is the, you know, first of all, there is deviation in the tail, but more importantly, there is actually deviation here, but it's a log scale, right? So it's hard to see. Right there, there is a particular pattern, which is the k equals zero. So when I have a hundred neurons, there is some probability, and it's actually quite high, that all hundred of them are exactly silent. Like, so nobody says a blip. Okay, that's the probability of being silent, P of PK equals zero. And, you know, there is like a pretty decent mismatch up here, given that that is actually the best sampled empirical pattern. This is the most frequent pattern in the, in the data. So it's a pretty strong deviation. And so what you can do is you can now supplement your Ising model with a potential, right? This is a max sand model now, which will exactly also match this P of K, this global synchrony. It will exactly match this curve. This means my max and model in addition to fields and couplings also gets kind of a global potential term, V of K, which again is just fitted same way as H and J. And you know, this is how it looks like as a function of K for this particular case um, of the network. And in particular, it has high values for zero, which means it increases the likelihood of silence because that's what you need to get the data right. So, and this has been observed, by the way, in many other recordings, cortical recordings and so on, the probability. So even if you account for all the pairwise correlations, the neurons like to be even more sparse or even more quiet if you want. They want to jointly be silent, right? So uh, individual blips, individual neurons making a blip, that's less likely then the pairwise model can account for. And silence is more likely in the data than the pairwise model can account for. And again, this has been reproduced in other systems later on. All right, so, you know, I try to make the part about the technical aspects of how to get the max and model short, because we talked about this yesterday. So what I want to focus here in the next slides is mainly, okay, you fit the model, you know, you can check that it, it works. In this case, it's this K pairwise model. What do you do with it? You know, what kind of stuff can we actually learn um, about the neural code? And what I'm showing is sort of a selection of results that I grouped into four categories here, uh, you know, somewhat arbitrary. So the first category is that 
once you construct this um, maximum entropy model, you can actually make statements that are, you know, kind of provably correct in some sense. For instance, we can, after we construct a maximum model, we can put a bound on the information transmission on how much information this subpopulation, let's say of 120 neurons for which I have a model, how many, you know, bits per bin, if you want, at most, can it communicate, okay? Now, we cannot estimate the, the correct value, the exact value, but we can upper bound. That's because what we are computing is a maximum, maximum entropy model. Of, of that model, we can compute the entropy, as you will see, right? So it's the entropy of these code words. And the entropy of the code words is an upper bound on the information transmission. So, you know, this is interesting because you could ask how many bits per second of information go through your optic nerve let's say or through the salamander optic nerve because this is a salamander recording in this case um so it's one set of results i'll try to demonstrate to you there is certain types of predictions which max and models make you've already seen one when we fitted the pairwise model it made a direct prediction for a distribution of synchrony it was a wrong prediction right it mismatched the data so we had so we expanded our model class to include that as a constraint and now this expanded model is of course again making predictions about other statistics of the data right which we can directly test so that's a nice bit about max and models is because they have sufficient statistics and we know exactly what they're fitting everything else they're not fitting is already a prediction that you can try to validate in the data so you can because these models are not infinitely expressive as in you know neural networks it's very clear already on the testing set what they are predicting and what they're not predicting of course you then train them to see that they're not overfit but you know they by construction cannot express certain things right and for them you know k you know, as you will see, for our model, let's say looking at three point correlations now is a prediction, right? Because we only constrain it by the global synchrony and by two point correlations. So we can ask it to predict three point correlations, let's say. The third class of results are really hypotheses about the structure of the neural code that our, our model will, will motivate. So, you know, they're hypotheses. They need to be independently later verified, checked, and, and, and so on, right? And, and the fourth class is that these models actually disprove some claims that were there in the literature and they were quite, um, how to say, entrenched. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to take you through this. So let me start with this bounce on information transmission. Yes, go ahead. I can repeat it if you want. What is the, the physical insight about the fact when you have many neurons more than just the desire? Why happen for more neurons, not for less? Sorry, what? So what? The, what's the insight about? No, what's the intuition like? Just think that for more neurons above under neurons, you need to meet this uh, case by potential. Yeah. 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 Data better. Yeah. But not for less yes. The okay, so the question is, what's the what's the intuition or what's the um, motivation for for large neurons to need this uh, global potential? Um, I am not exactly sure. I mean, if if what if you are very pedantic, you can see very small deviations already for the group of ten neurons. Uh, you know, the question is, is it already statistically significant? But as you look at many subgroups, there is a consistent pattern as this deviation in probability of silence, let's say, will get larger and larger with the size. So it's not that there is like a magic transition, you know, up to then pairwise models are fine and then they're not fine. Uh, we do have a mechanistic, like mechanistically, you can try to guess, you know, as said, you know, this is a feature that is actually also in the cortex and so on, right? So it's not limited to the retina. Uh, so somehow one possibility why we observe this is because many of these neurons, you know, you can imagine if you have like a joint inhibitory apparatus that is, that is kind of keeping, the, you know, homeostatically the activity of the neurons um, at, at some particular rate, right? There will be you know, there could be global circuitry that actually jointly inhibits or keeps like a lid on, if you want, on the activity of these neurons that are actually like primary neurons that code for the information. So, so one thing is that we would be seeing a statistical signature of such a mechanism, but whether that's true or not, that, that's purely a hypothesis, right? I mean, this is a statistical model that we're fitting. Um, I'm not sure I can, you know, I can say more about it, but, you know, that's one, one thing. What if you subsample the 100 neurons? You can you see exactly the same data as the 10 neurons? Or does that, I mean, one option is 
could be uh, unstructured operations as well. It, it, it this always it could be, but as said, I mean this you know this at least qualitatively this result about the silence has been has been reproduced in many different preparations in many different tissues. So so I think it's more general than you know than kind of an art, like experimental artifact. Um, I, I think it's really something about the excess sparsity of the neural code. Um, and in, in even from the coding perspective, you, I mean, now I'm hand waving, okay? But you know, even from the coding perspective, it actually makes sense. So you 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 look like patterns, you know, where everyone is silent but one neuron makes a blip, are patterns which are very robust to noise. I'm uh, not robust to noise. I'm sorry, right? So there is kind of a likelihood that you know one neuron will blip spontaneously, and there seems to be a mechanism to suppress those to increase just either complete silence or when the neurons do respond, they respond more synchronously than you would have imagined, right? So there is like groups of them that co-activate. Um, and, you know, given that individual neurons are not very reliable, that might be a good idea for coding. But, you know, again, that's speculation. So, uh, so okay, so one thing is, so, you know, one type of result is that we can actually estimate or upper bound the entropy of these code words. Um, there is multiple ways of doing that. And just, you know, just for you to, to, to get in, that's a non-trivial computation. We're computing an entropy over a distribution that has, you know, two to the 120 states, okay? So by direct summation of P log P, you will never get it, okay? So you have to use some tricks. We have this probabilistic model that we have fitted, which looks like statistical physics model. You can actually use the tricks from statistical physics to get its entropy. So there is a well-known method, right, which is called the thermodynamic integration, by which, you know, if you have the model, you pretend you're changing the temperature from zero to some final temperature in your model. In our model, the temperature is the thing that multiplies the energy function that's in the exponent. You can introduce that fictitious temperature and do this integration, and you can estimate the entropy. It's a mathematical trick, which is correct even when you don't have systems at the equilibrium it just doesn't have the correct interpretation but the entropy that you come out you know you you, you can get it you can use very sophisticated methods of monte carlo sampling that were, that were designed to compute the entropy so the usual metropolis is not designed to compute the entropy but various if you are familiar with one landau type sampling will get you directly the partition and uh, and entropy out or and that's very interesting <laughs> In our model, as I, as, I, as I told you, it has this fantastic property that is non-generic, which is that there are microscopic patterns that are sampled with very high precision empirically. Even when you go to 120 neurons, the probability of silence of everyone being quiet happens many, many times in the data. So you can just get its value. So as soon as you have a probability of one microstate empirically, then by by the parameterization of our model, the probability of silence is exactly one over the partition function. Remember in the exponent, there is all sorts of stuff. If you insert for the activity of all neurons, X equals zero, then all the terms are zero. So the only thing that you're left is one over Z, okay? And so you can actually get the Z directly because there is this microstate that's sampled very precisely, even though the dimensionality of the problem is large. So you can do it either, and once you have the Z, you can get the entropy you know, classical thermodynamic relationships. So you can do it in all three ways and you get very nice consistent estimates. And what you find is the following. So this is entropy per neuron. This is what the independent model would be and it has to be constant, right? For, sub, for subgroups of neurons because, you know, per neuron, the things without any interactions are, are just uh, extensive. But for our maximum entropy models that you build for 10, 20, blah, 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 50 groups of neurons, 100 neurons, per neuron entropy is still slowly decreasing as we make the network bigger and bigger. So we are not in the extensive regime yet, okay? Even if you go out to 120 neurons, what does that mean? Well, that means that as we increase the, the patch that we look at, this is a patch, is a subsample from a very highly tightly coupled system, okay? We're recording more and more neurons and and basically, there is a lot of correlations between them. So as I include more and more neurons, they're still being constrained by other neurons that I'm not looking at, right? So I have not yet scaled into a regime where it's extensive. Now, we do believe that there is other estimates done before that in the salam and the retina, the relevant patch of highly coupled neurons that all encode the same stimulus, about two to 300 of them, 
okay? And then of course the retina you can think of as a carpet composed of many, you know, of many such patches that, that, that are correlated, right? But about two to 300 neurons is a highly correlated unit that is encoding the stimulus in a certain little patch of the visual world, okay? So we are seeing how this <clears throat> entropy per neuron is going down. And as I said, you know, this is putting an upper bound on the information transmission. So for 100 neurons, we, you know, with about 0 0.17 bits per neuron, you can multiply that by, a, by, a, by 100. That's the number of bits that this population of 100 is able to, at most, transmit per 20 milliseconds, because these are 20 millisecond samples. This can only be decreased because the samples are correlated through time and so on, it, but it cannot be higher, right? Because this is a maximum entropy model. So it's the highest possible entropy consistent with constraints. It can be smaller, but it cannot be higher. That's why it's upper bounding the, the information transmission. So I think this is, that's the thing I, uh, I was saying. And you can make more progress along these lines. I just want to illustrate sort of one type of result you can get, which is about uh, transmission. Um, second, second observation, uh, also very interesting if you're from a kind of statistical physics background. Um, so there is a, just to see how weird these patterns are, you can ask yourself, what's the probability, you know, if from my data set, in my data set, that I randomly draw a pattern and I randomly draw another pattern, what's the probability they're, they're the same one, right? So this coincidence probability. And how does that coincidence probability behave as you make the network, uh, the number of neurons larger and larger? Now, if, if, this was a, if these neurons were independent, it's very easy to convince yourself that this will exponentially drop, right? As, as you take more and more neurons, it's expon so larger and larger binary words, you're exponentially less likely that what you sample once and what you sample the second time is actually the same in all spins, okay? So that's this fast drop. But for both the experimental data and the k-pairwise model, which reproduces this coincidence probability nearly perfectly, this uh, decreases way, way, way more slowly than you would expect. And that is not actually something that you typically expect. Um, we can also show that this is not simply due to the fact that the probability of silence is, is high. So, you know, you, you could think, okay, that's just a consequence of the all silent pattern is very frequent. So, you know, I sample once and I get all silent. I sample the second time I get all silent. So that's, that's, that's the, the only thing. No, there is also other patterns that exactly repeat many times in the data set. And so you're much more likely than you would have thought to draw exactly the same configuration. So here, you know, there is interesting consequences about, again, it's a test of the model, but it's an interesting way to think about an ensemble of high dimensional code words where this coincidence probability is decreasing so slowly. It doesn't even look exponential. It kind of goes even more slowly. Okay, so here is another type of prediction that the, that the model makes. Uh, so we can, we still have enough or barely enough data to estimate empirically um, the three point connected correlation function. So correlation between neurons i, j, and k, right? Expectation values of i, j, and k, three neurons firing together. Um, and so this is, you know, from the experiment and, and this would be a prediction. Um, if you construct only pairwise models, so Ising-like without this global term, you see, you know, this is now scatter plot of one versus the other. And sort of these are binned predictions because there is many, many, right? There's 10, 100 choose three of these numbers. So if you just plot dots, you don't see anything. So these are binned. Um, but you see that the pairwise model has this systematic deviation, right? So it kind of over predicts three point correlations for positive correlations and it under predicts the negative ones, right? Because this is the equality line and the K pairwise model, the one that has the global constraint is actually doing a much better job. It's not perfect. There is some deviation for the negative three point correlations, but it's, it's definitely much better. Um, so the bias is very small and maybe I, I skip that. The point of that is that your error in three point um, correlations is actually not increasing with the system sizes. You take more and more neurons, these errors, you're making an error, but it, you know, the error is, is, is flat. Um, and so the hypothesis maybe, you know, as you make more and more neurons, there is of course more and more things that you could mispredict because there is more and more three point correlations. But at the same time, your model is capturing more and more 
of you know the neurons that otherwise would would constitute hidden units because you don't they influence what you observe but you don't model them but yeah. as you start increasing the group of neurons you, you of course start modeling them so there is less and less kind of latent factors that you are um, uh, that could influence the observed neurons so that's one example where the max n model is simply predicting some higher order statistics that you can directly compare to the data okay so now uh, you know we are coming to um, uh, to these more hypothetical notes. So, you know, these are, so up to now, there were things that you can either say with certainty or you can compare to data. Okay, so now you can start looking more in, in more detail about what this model is saying and making hypotheses of how the neural coding might work. So one, one hypothesis that we entertained at the beginning uh, was that because the energy landscape of the model is, there is lots of frustration, right? In this energy function that we inferred because there is positive and negative JIJs, that maybe we have a, an energy landscape or a probability landscape, which is very rugged, okay? So it has basins of attraction, maybe as, as, as you might know from Hopfield type models or so. And that, you know, what, what this is now a schematic diagram, what this might mean is of course that there, is, there are particular configurations of, of, of firing of activity, which are local energy minima. So if you flip any spin, you would go towards up in energy, meaning, meaning down in probability, right? And the, that information about the stimulus is not encoded in the exact microscopic state of firing or not. It's encoded by the identity of the basin of attraction where I'm at. And this would provide, as people have discussed before, it would provide a code that's robust to noise and so on, and a code that's maybe learnable downstream, right? So that, so that was our initial idea. And we actually could validate that our models do have multiple basins of attraction and so on and so forth. Um, and they are reproduced, like, and if you, because we uh, repeat exactly the same stimulus many, many times, you can validate that on one particular repetition, we are in this basin and the retina emits some sort of microstate, so pattern of spikes and silences. On the next repetition, the exact microstate of spikes and silences is slightly different, but it's still in the same basin. Okay, and the, the third repetition again, right? There is microscopic changes in which neuron is active or not, but you're always at the same point in the same basin when the same stimulus is being displayed on screen. Okay, and so there is, um, we did some subsequent work that really pursued just that idea of basin code, which is, which is what you're seeing here. So what you're seeing here is the retina, it's a, a new experiment because it's a later experiment. Uh, it's the retina responding again to a natural type movie. This is time. Each of these lines is a repetition. So there's many repetitions of exactly the same movie. And the color code here is encoding, is denoting a collective state. It's not exactly the basin of attraction because this was a slightly different model, but it is, it's, it's, a, it's something very similar. It's the collective state of the retina that roughly corresponds to basins. And what you will see that across the repeats, the retina quite precisely takes on the same collective state, even though if you zoomed in, you know, there is lots of differences on the level of individual neurons when they spike or not, right? But the collective state is corresponding kind of to those basins is the same. There is a bit of a jitter, as you see in timing, when you enter it and when you don't enter it. And maybe that's also dependent on how we actually quantify that. But, but in general, you see high reproducibility of collective activity patterns. Now, you know, further on, <laughs> I wanted to take this idea apart. Um, what it looks, so this is of course how a physicist would like to understand it through basins. And I said, you know, then we followed up on it uh, here and here. It's not precisely that it turns out the landscape is, you cannot think of the landscape of really basins. It's more the visualization that we have here. So I'll try to parse it for you. There is, so this is now probability landscape plotted, of course, I mean, this is multi-dimensional and discrete. So this is for schematic, right? It's plotted the smooth in kind of small number of dimensions so we can visualize it, but the landscape looks more like that. So there is one global probability maximum. that's like a global attractor, which corresponds to the retina just being silent. That's the silent state. It likes to be, that's the highest probability state is no neuron does anything, okay? 
And then from this silent state, you can imagine that there is along many of these discrete dimensions, there are ridges and troughs. So there is always this global attractor that you can go to. But if you try to move orthogonally to it, right, you go through stuff that looks like that, right? So there is like, so there is patterns here that encode for a particular stimulus that's very well separated from the other states here, but you can always go to the silent state. And that's because that's what retina prefers. If you don't drive it by any stimulus, it actually goes there. Then you display it as stimulus, it goes to this collective state, which is very well separated from the other ones. But then of course, you know, it kind of tends back to silence if you don't drive it, okay? So the, the kind of picture is a little bit more like that than like that we think, but of course it's hard to visualize this, right? Because it's high dimensional discrete space. Um, Yes, but but not oftentimes you would, you know, if how to say if you stimulated the retina with a blink and then relax, you you'd kind of, you know, you'd go up and then back, right? To silence, right? Go up and then go down another side of your left screen. Yeah, the, I mean this sort of that you have to drive the retina strongly to do that. Yes. Yeah. That is what we hypothesize. It's very difficult to check, right? Because I mean, you, you, so why is it very difficult to check? It's because um, you drive it. I mean, the retina really most nicely responds to natural stimulation. So, in, and in natural stimulation, it's very hard to say what is a stimulus, right? It's it's a full movie where many things happen at the same time. So it's you, know, you can try to do it, and I think Michael Berry was following up, but I don't know the latest, the experimentalist, right? You can try to train the retina or a train, you can try to display a discrete set of stimuli, okay? So that you, you know you only have, I don't know, 10 different pictures that you show it, and then try to ask whether, you know, the resulting landscape would, would, would form 10 ridges, right? Uh, each corresponding to a stimulus. Um, and I know that they made some progress on that, but I haven't, you know, it's not, I haven't seen the, the results from that. Okay, so, so the, and that's of course that rich like thing. It's it's a hypothesis. Okay, it, it's kind of what the model suggests that that might be the organization principle of the neural code, and I think there is a lot of work if you wanted to validate that or not, and kind of lots of experiments. So the so the so the next thing, you know, the next kind of a idea of such character, which is very hypothetical, right, connects to uh, some of you might be uh, interested in that, connects to the idea of criticality in neural systems. Um, and in particular, there is a construction that you can do from the model and from the data, which is kind of different from the criticality that some of you might know uh, from uh, you know, avalanches and so on. So what, what I can construct is the following, both in the data or in the model. I can ask how many patterns, you can just count them, how many distinct patterns have approximately the same probability. So in, uh, in my model, the probability is like the energy, right? Because probability is e to the energy. Um, and the number of patterns is just the entropy, right? That's a microcanonical, just, I just count and take the log. That's the, that's the entropy, right? And so um, this is what it is, right? So I essentially am, for physicists, we are computing the microcanonical entropy as a function of the energy. So log of the number of states that have a certain probability. Um, and, you know, if you wanted to pursue the idea of criticality as in statistical physics, you would look for the condition that you see right there, that the microcanonical entropy, second derivative, is, is vanishing um, at the critical point. So, because patterns actually repeat in the data, I have some handle on this dependence. Entropy, here you see it as a entropy. So, this is log number of patterns, if you want entropy per neuron. This is log probability, which is energy per neuron, right? So I can take small groups of neurons. I think this, uh, this dark blue here is subgroups of 10 neurons, and then it goes 20, 30, 40 uh, in terms of color, okay? And for small groups of neurons, I can just, you know, I can just look at all the patterns. I can empirically estimate their probability. Log of that is the, uh, is the energy, and I can count how many possible patterns have this particular probability, and I plot it on the y-axis. You know, how many patterns have this particular log probability, and I plot it 
on the, on the y-axis and across many subgroups of 10 neurons, I get a particular curve. Looks nothing special, okay? For 10 neurons, it's here. For 20 neurons, for 30 neurons. But as you see, as I take more and more neurons, of course, then I, you know, my sampling gets restricted and restricted. So I can, I can only see a smaller and smaller part of this curve because I'm limited in, you know, for many neurons, how many samples I can actually count. But what is happening is that, you know, these curves, as I take larger and larger network of neurons, actually are approaching a straight line. And you can do formal extrapolations of these curves, right, by taking n to infinity. But you can extrapolate where this would be for a large network of neurons. And the extrapolation points are these black points that you see here, right? They're ex like extrapolation goes from 10, 20, 30, 40, up to infinite neurons, right? So it goes like this to get this point. It goes like this to get this point. So this is how extrapolation looks like. And you, you find out that all of these points would end up on literally an equality line where the numerosity is balanced by the probability, okay? Now, this is a very weird construction because typically, uh, you know, you would have a, if you have a critical point, you have a second derivative vanishing uh, for a particular value of energy. But here, if this is a line, the line has a zero second derivative every, everywhere. So it's kind of a very weird system, right? That is, that looks kind of, you know, it's not like a critical point that corresponds to particular E, right? It's the whole thing is critical. And of course, in the model that you fit to the same data, you can take this further because in the model, once we construct it, we can sample as much as we want from it and just compute directly this quantity. So here in the data, we are limited, right? By sampling to see this, this little bit. And in the model, we can just compute the whole curve, right? And, you know, and you see the same thing, right? As, I mean, this is capturing that. And so it's maybe not surprising that in this lower range, you see these extrapolations, but also there is a behavior for high for less probable patterns, which you can now, which the model extrapolates to, which you don't have empirically in the data, right? So entropy per neuron equals energy per neuron to a good approximation. Uh, this is both in the model and in the data. And it's a very peculiar behavior, which has another signature one can show analytically. If this is true, that what you're seeing here, then this is equivalent to plotting a zip flaw for the configurations. What does that mean, right? I look at the probability of every binary configuration that I have and either in model or in the data. And then I rank order all the microscopic patterns in the data according to their probability. And I plot log probability versus log rank. And what you will observe is that this plot log probability versus log rank is a line. So it's a power law with slope minus one with particular minus one slope, okay? Uh, this is an, a direct consequence of this scaling. It's another way to describe this. And this has been nicely shown in the work of Thierry Mora, you know, that these two statements are equivalent. Um, I'll just point that there is a very nice, uh, this work motivated a, a very nice uh, PRL paper by David Schwab, Pilian Nemenman, and uh, Pankaj Mehta, where they explained how this, minus one zip in such systems can emerge without fine tuning. Um, so for those of you who are interested in criticality uh, of this particular sort, it's a very nice, uh, it's a very nice reference. Now, you know, my, ta my take on it is, is, you know, it is the fact that these distributions are, you know, weird in the sense that you would not expect them from like a generic Ising model. I mean, you would not even expect them from an Ising model at the critical point in this particular form. Um, whether it's a consequence of some special adaptation in the retina or some special fine tuning, I would not speculate. I don't know that. But if you're a downstream area, let's say a visual cortex who is receiving these spikes, right? That's a very peculiar distribution to learn. You know, maybe it helps with learning. There's all sorts of hypotheses why this might be good. Certainly you have this property that there will be microstates that exactly repeat. So, you know, if the downstream area has to learn some stuff, maybe this is something it can rely on. So they're very spe speculative, but I, you know, bring it up because this is a very salient signature that the models helped us get. Right, you can, uh, that's the last uh, crazy bit. So uh, let me just outline that. So you can, you can then play a game and ask, is there anything special about the setting of correlations or mean firing rates that makes that critical signature? 
So what we have done here is we played with the model in a very, uh, in a very um, perverted way, okay? So, so you can fit, when we fit the max end model, you can imagine that no, the alpha is not here. And this would be our model that we have fitted, right? So there's, there is fields, there is pairwise couplings, and there is, there is this global term, okay? And now what I can start to do is I can, I can now, this is, I can only do that in the model, right? I can now put a factor in here that is scaling this term up or down. So that this term is responsible for all the correlations between the neurons. And if I scale the correlations up, I can retweak the individual fields such that the result still has the firing rate. The mean firing rates of neurons will be always fixed to data. So every individual neuron always fires as in the data, but I can make them more or less correlated by changing this alpha. Alpha equals one is exactly what the data is at. If I put alpha equals zero, I get rid of all correlation. So I get an independent set of neurons. And if I put alpha more than one, I make them more correlated, but still firing at exactly the same mean, each one of them, okay? And I can look at what kind of code I get. So this would be when I set alpha to zero and they're not correlated. And of course, then, you know, I can, what, what you see here is just some example firing patterns sorted. So these are neurons and, you know, these are firing patterns, the most, Frequent one is everyone quiet. So this is, there is a pattern where everyone is zero and then, you know, more and more neurons fire. If you look at the correlations as consistent with the, uh, with my, uh, you know, alpha equal zero, you know, there is no correlation among them, right? So this is alpha equal one. This is the actual fit to data. So you see, you know, if you look by eye, they don't look very different, these patterns, okay? From, from, from the non-correlated, that's because all correlations are weak, okay? Uh, but but if you histogram the correlation coefficients, as you see, you have to get something that, you know, it's slight, you know, it has this tail, but small values as we are used to. If I make them more correlated, then you start seeing this, okay? So this, you, you just by eye, you see what starts emerging are these, are kind of basins of attraction, right? I made things very frustrated, very correlated. And now, even if I sample the patterns, you see that there is this similarities, right? This bunch is presumably coming from one attractor because there is this you know, these guys are always on and then there's a few blips somewhere, right? And then there is a next attractor and so on. And the correlations, still a lot of them zero, but this tail has started to expand out, right? And so you have some pairs that are really strongly correlated. These are these pairs, right? This guy and this guy, right? They're strongly correlated. They're always on together, okay? So I can make this code more and more frustrated, more and more glassy if you want as I go that way. Could you change H prime when you... You, you have to solve another optimization nonlinear problem. So it's a pure numerically. So, um, but you can check, of course, once you retune, you can check that you got what you have to get. And so what, what you know, is interesting is that now you can ask as a function of this alpha. So as I change these correlations, I can do my, you know, usual thing in statistical physics. I plot, let's say, what would be in a, in an, in an Ising model heat capacity with the emerging peak as a, as a signature of, of critical behavior. And what's interesting is that as I go from independent code, alpha zero to some very correlated code, alpha equal two, alpha equal one is actually the data. So you will see as I take larger and larger group of neurons, right, 120 is this last curve up here, the peak really moves close to where the data is at, which is the red line. So actually, if I make code more correlated it, in this signature, I go away from criticality, right? So somehow, this particular strength of correlations that's observed in the data is the one that's kind of singled out as being close to the peak. Of course, you can play the extrapolation game and ask, you know, maybe we are actually at the peak when you take more, because 120 is just what we can record, you know. So, so the, uh, the correlated patch, as, we, as I told you, is be presumably between two and 300 neurons. Okay, so again, this is suggesting that the code is close to critical. What does that mean for neural coding? I don't know. I mean, there is a lot of hypotheses floating around. They're interesting, um, but I think the final word has not been said. It does show though that these ensembles are in some sense special. Right, that's, that's that. Okay, and then the last bit that I would like to show, show to you is more concrete again, so it's less crazy. This is the bit where I said that this, this type of analysis actually disproves certain notions that were quite persistent uh, before in the field. Um, you know, there, the coding, neural coding, retinal coding, visual cortex coding, 
was really dominated by the idea of decorrelation, if you are familiar with this idea. So very correlated stimuli come into our eyes, and then the circuit somehow removes a lot of this correlation because that's efficient for coding and produces responses that are quite decorrelated. Okay. Now, I've already hinted at the fact that the code cannot be independent and it cannot be completely decorrelated because otherwise we could throw correlations away and we would get a bunch of independent neurons. And you saw that that doesn't describe the data very well. You have to put in correlations, right? Somehow. But what I haven't shown you uh, yet is how strong that constraint is in terms of effects on the neural code of individual neurons. So here is, here is what I would like to show to you now. Um, right, we display a movie to the neurons, and because of that, as time goes by, so here what you're seeing in the red is one example firing rate, so the average activity of one neuron, okay, so uh, in the movie. So it's quiet and a little blip, then it's, it likes something in the movie very strongly, so it makes this response and, and so on. These are, these are these peaks, okay. Now, my, mo my mo Maxent model completely ignores time and stimulus, right? It just takes all the patterns without any order, right? And builds a model for all the patterns. There is nothing about time or stimulus in the model. But what I can now do still with the model is I can say, could I predict the behavior of this one neuron, let's say, this is the one chosen neuron, random neuron. Can I predict what it does by knowing what its partners in the network are doing? Right, so I have a joint distribution, right? I have this object. I have P of X1, Xn. And I ask, can I predict the first guy by knowing what the others are doing? Well, that basically just means, can I say, what is the P of X1 given that X2 up to Xn, I know their state, okay, in the data. Can I predict, the, can I predict this guy? So if I have a joint distribution, clearly I can construct this, right? And I don't know anything else about the stimulus or time. So this is the stimulus or time is somehow in the activity of the others, okay? So what I can do is I can take my data set and my model, and I can take my model for say groups of 10 neurons and you know, from the nine others predict this guy and you know, it gets something pretty bad. And I can group, take groups of 20, 40, 80. And then when I take my full group of 120, I predict this guy from the 119 of his neighbors, this is what I get with, you know, with like variability across repeats is the thin lines, right? So I have a very good prediction of what one guy is doing from what the rest is doing. Um, and this is independent of which neuron I choose. This is the one example neuron there. But if you, you know, if, if you ask uh, for each one of them, what's the correlation coefficient when I make the prediction for one of them from the rest, you should, in this plot, you should be looking at the, at the blue dots. I basically get 80% correlation but predicting one from the rest so this redundant like this this type of coupling that's in the network and these weak correlations still amount on the level of individual neuron to a very very high predictive power and therefore very high redundancy in coding right i mean it, the coding is super redundant if you can predict what one guy is doing from the, from what the others are doing without directly knowing the stimulus and so this is to my mind is still one of the best demonstrations that although the neurons on the pairwise level are not much correlated. There is still a lot of redundancy, which could be in principle used for error correction, right? Because if individual neurons are noisy, you know, the collective state corrects, you know, mistakes of an of a, of a individual neuron and you can co co construct decoders that make use of that. And this same analysis was, was much later done by, uh, by the group of David Tang and, and, and by, by uh, Mishulam. Um, same thing on hippocampus neur neurons, same, you, you will even see basically the same plots uh, in the paper. So it's not something that's restricted to the retina. Okay, so you can, you can take other brain areas and, and see signatures of, of, of this redundancy. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
support the point of the no. Yes, that it means that. No, I, I, why would we? I mean, I think so. There is no if like, there is no notion. I think in the at least in in retinal coding that some neurons would be the how to say master neurons or leading neurons. That if they, if that's the question, right? That some would be special in that others are just like coupled into them and kind of mimic what what the few leaders do. Uh, the notion in at least in retinal coding is that the, it, it is a distributed code, so it is redundant but distributed without any like special, you know, kind of center or main neurons or something like that. But the thing which uh, is uh, kind of curious that the aspect uh, a specific area of the of the retina. Mm -hmm. So, so well, in this case, right, the the whole retina is seeing this natural movie. It, the, the, you know, the, the only thing is that you're recording and analyzing just from the piece of the retina, which, of course, looks at the piece of the movie. But otherwise, it's the whole retina is stimulated, right? Okay, so if I enlarge uh, the neurons, that's when you are Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I see what you're saying. Uh, so, so the model, uh, of course, the model only describes what you put in. So you put in the recording of these 160 neurons. But of course, the fact of the matter is that these 160 neurons that you are focusing on and recording, because they interact with the other neurons in the retina that you are not recording, but they are still there and they respond to the movie, um, the model needs to somehow effectively take those other ones into account. Okay. Uh, how does it do that? It's, it's very hard to say, right? So you can only predict or, or check that it works well by comparing it to the data for things you do see. Um, a little bit we were looking at, at that, right? At, that, at, the, at the question of, so there was this interesting idea, which I still don't know whether it's true or not because I don't have data to check, whether all these like higher order effects that we had to put in, like the V of K, the potential, right? Whether, or, or, the, or the JIJ matrix, does as I if I were able to record more and more neurons and include more and more in the model, would those terms get simpler? Because right now they're maybe complicated in part because they effectively account for what all the other neurons are doing, right? And maybe they would get simpler if I can record more, but we don't know that. Yeah. Well, this uh, is a new recording that was not used for training the model, or is it? Uh... This one? No, that one is the same one. Okay. It's the same. It's the same. Have you tried on kind of a test recording? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a uh, that is a very good question. I um not exactly in this manner, but a, a similar work was done later on by Ulisse Ferrari at uh, in Paris with Olivier Mar. It's not exactly the same, but there what was done was like on on one recording, so same neuron, you cannot switch neurons to another retina, but same, same neurons in one retina exposed to stimulus one to fit the model and to, to get the JIJ, the correlated activity, JIJ out, and then predict on another piece of the different movie, but same neurons to show how well, how well which component of the model carries over. It's actually a very nice piece of work in, in PRE. And you can show that there is a part of correlations that you can learn, which are in the JIJ that generalizes very nicely from, from movie to movie. Uh, and, you know, these are experimentalists in the retina who uh, later went on to try to even part, right? This nice piece that generalizes from stimulus to stimulus is, is, is actually the piece that has, um, um, that has a connectivity that drops with distance. And it's presumably because some of these neurons are coupled via gap junctions. And so there is like an, an actual mechanism that couples the activity of nearby guys together. I, I can, you know, I can point to the reference for that. Yep. I have a lot of questions. Yes, yes. Before we see that for some additional higher order statistics, we see that errors is the content for the 
Balance of That's what we, you know, this might be. We, we don't know. Yeah. What if, is it possible that if we increase enough the size, at some point this effect, positive effect of improving more tolerance just uh, drops because we could stay like this? Mm -hmm. like yeah. Can that be a like, signature of like, the of the yeah, yeah, absolutely. I absolutely that would be great. I mean, I think here in this, you know, uh, like the, the 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 kind of history of this particular set of experiments was all like, you know, first experimental setup able to record 10, 10 to 40 neurons. And the next experimental setup, you know, was up to 160. 160 was just at the boundary of you know of of like feeling the full putative size, which is, you know, a set of a correlated group in this retina, about two to 300. Where do people come, like, where does this estimate two to 300 come from? It came from looking at how redundant are, you know, in another experiment, you can stick electrodes in basically, or you can use arrays that are more spaced. So you don't see all the neurons, but you can see further away. And you can ask how correlated are the neurons at this distance, at that distance, at this distance, at this distance, as they look at natural movies. And, you know, the, for the salamander retina, uh, the experimentalists show that basically once you go to a patch that has more than roughly two to 300 neurons, then the neurons really get decorrelated even in the sense that even these small, small correlation coefficients are gone away, okay? So they look at different type of the stimulus. They're not co-activated together anymore. And so that's the effective range. And so then this experimental setup said, can we record a macroscopic fact, fraction of these neurons in the patch, right? So 120, 160 out of 300. So it's about a half, but it was not pushed, you know, experimentally at that point, it, they did not push it to 300. Uh, now I think one can do it, uh, probably one, one could do it and actually get the full patch, at least in the salamander. Um, but, you know, everyone also kind of migrates from salamander to mouse and so on. So it's, a, so it's complicated for other reasons, but but yes, I think that I think that would be like the cool thing would be right to scale it up, do exactly this, but just scale it up and see many signatures of you know correlations go away, JIJ decay at this length, the entropy gets extensive because you are coming to the point where this patch is saying something else than this patch, right? So you could see many of these things simultaneously if what we are saying has any uh, extrapolation merit. Okay, we just that nobody has done. It. So far as I know. Okay, so I'll, let me conclude. So I, you know, so here was sort of a, a kind of a selection, if you want, of highlights um, about what you can discover about the neural code, what hypotheses you can make if you use this maximum entropy principle um, to build models. Um, I haven't shown you anything about this neural model hypothesis testing. But if I summarize what I showed, so you see this interesting emergence of very strong collective behaviors, synchronized activity, um, even though individual pairwise correlations are small, you see non-extensive entropy scaling and high coincidence probability because microstates repeat. Um, the retinal input is far from decorrelated, uh, you know, which flies against typical efficiency arguments for the retina. It is in some sense efficient. Many like natural stimuli are more correlated in some sense than retinal output, but that does not mean that retinal output is decorrelated. It's not decorrelated. There's still a lot of redundancy in them, which could be used for error correction or learning perhaps. Uh, the code seems to be organized in, in these collective modes of activity that resemble basins of attraction with some caveats um, that seem to really encode information about the stimulus. And we have these interesting signatures of statistical criticality that you can make a bit more precise. What that means is still an open question, whether that's due to adaptation, due to downstream learner learnability of the code, or as Nemenman and Schwab and so on suggested, it can be a generic result in a very large class of models without any fine tuning. And you expect that. So that all on the table. All right. So maybe I uh, end here and take any questions. If there is any more, we have some, which was very nice during the talk, but any any other questions? So there is something in the chat, maybe I'll check. No, that's just working fine. Okay. Yes.
Okay. No, maybe oh, yeah, now okay. it was great. Okay. Um, the fact that retinal output are from for being decorrelated uh, could be used in a way to uh, model attention in a feed forward uh, manner, meaning if we, if we assume that there are bunches of neurons correlated to one single neuron that is responsible for the, the output that maybe are, I don't know, like inhibitory type of neuron. Uh, do you think that this kind of model can, can explain this, uh, this behavior? I don't know if my question is clear. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I would not say that there is anything, well, so this is retina, right? So it, it's still thought of a, of a circuit that, I mean, has some lateral connectivity, but mainly it's feed forward in the sense that, you know, information goes in and then it's sent to the brain without much stuff going back from the brain into the retina. Um, so kind of the attention mechanisms are usually thought of top-down recurrent connections that don't go to the retina, but you could try to make similar arguments or similar model constructions, let's say for neurons in the, in the primary visual cortex, right? Where there could be top-down attention modulation. And, uh, you know, there has been not of this flavor, but there has obviously been work, statistical work done on recordings from prim primary visual cortex in trying to account. So what you can do there is try to account for, um, uh, how to say, shared modulation of activity, which will show itself up in, in, in like in, in correlated activity of a group of neurons, because perhaps that group, you know, is, is receiving uh, some sort of top-down connection that kind of gains it up or, or down, right? And so there is some, I mean, many people have done, there is some very nice work from the group of Eero Simoncelli trying to build statistical models that, you know, account for, let's say, slow modulated latent variables that you don't observe, but statistically explain, right, how whole groups of neurons are slowly gained up and down together and so on. Um, and, you know, one, one question is like, would these type of models, would they reveal, if you apply it to, to that data, you know, would, would, would they reveal signatures of that? Maybe, you know, for some sort of global potentials like V of K or, so it, it's perfectly possible to think about it in that, in that system. And the retina is more difficult, right? Because just because of how it's wired up. On the same line, basically, uh, the correlation between the neurons uh, has is part of two different contributes. One that is uh, related to the neural activity and so how the, the uh, network works, and the other uh, is due to the uh, correlation in division of the of the retina, so mm -hmm. in uh, in the stimulus. Mm -hmm. Using this approach, uh, there is uh, some way in order to discriminate between the uh, structural correlation that are those mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. important in order if we want to have an insight in how the network works yep. and those uh, pertaining to the, the stimulus. So it's a perfect question. So if I can have the last 15 minutes on the blackboard, this is what I would like to actually take up. So, so the question to, for, 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 to simplify, if I, if I can, or to stylize it a bit, right, is that here, this model um, is just modeling the total correlation between, say, any pair of neurons, okay? Or, right, the question is like, where, can we use the correlation to reveal something about the circuitry? This model doesn't do it because, it, you know, all the correlation is the same for this MAXN model, whether it comes from the fact that stimulus is co-activating two neurons in, and that therefore they are correlated, or is because neuron A talks to neuron B, right? There is wires in between and that's why they are correlated, right? So this model doesn't distinguish sources of correlation in any way. And the question is, can maybe this type of framework or something else be used to discriminate these sources? Because, you know, there are certain sources of correlation due to wiring that maybe we could use to infer which neurons, let's say, are jointly connected, regulated, and so on. But for that, we'd have to discount these other sources of correlation, let's say, the same stimulus hitting the neuron, right? Um, so that is what I wanted to sketch on the blackboard in the last, you know, it, I don't think I need more than 15 minutes, so I can try it. Please do. We okay. actually an interesting set of lectures on causality last week. So these guys uh, yes. will appreciate so, that. So how do we, so I just stop share, right? That's what yeah. I do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but now the question is how do we make
how how do we make it's visible i think it's visible it just it needs light that's all. that's what i think what we need um so so what i'll try to do very briefly so i only have this one one page i wanted to show uh is this second use of maximum entropy models as as as, as presenting to us a set of null distributions against which we can do statistical tests and that's relevant for what you ask although maybe it does not seem that way yet um but let me let me just start by this question right so the problem statement is really this by observing correlation between two new York, two neurons can i say something about whether they actually interact or not you know that's that's what i want to uh, to to ask and uh, in what you have seen right now you, you know what what can we do right so if i take so i'll here these are two neurons and they have some correlation you know coefficient let's say cab that that i observed and you know the first order question is simply to ask is that correlation significant statistically significant okay and, you know that is very simple right of course you can take the you know raster of neuron a and here is the raster of neuron b by raster i just mean this binarized you know uh, spike train this is time right and i can take the the responses of the other neuron if you want like that and you know here is a sort of a zero order order thing everyone can do in the computer right uh, to assess significance you can just create a random permutation of these of the time bins with respect to you know each other to destroy all the correlations of course because the data is finite the correlation will never be exactly zero but you can do it many many times and construct if you want cab a null distribution pcab after doing many many shuffles so you expect that null distribution to be you know picked around zero correlation but due to some finite sampling there will be some spread and compared to this null distribution you can test the actual cab let's say it stands here right this is the true value and this is sort of the kind of null distribution constructed which you know which is not zero strictly just because of finite data and then you can you know put a p value on the significance of this being non zero right i mean this is a sort of pedestrian way in which you can do it but you can do it very quickly okay through a shuffle okay so the idea was shuffle the spike trains create that null distribution now of course oftentimes if, even if you conclude that a pair is significantly correlated it doesn't tell you why it's significantly correlated and in particular for sensory systems right this the first hypothesis that you think about is that there is a stimulus that drives these guys and therefore you know if these two neurons look at the same part of the sky they are seeing the same stimulus and so even if they don't talk to each other they will be correlated to some extent right automatically because of because of that right and so what we what you want to do then is you want to do something slightly different well let me erase that right you are really interested in whether the responses of these guys are conditionally independent given the stimulus right whether the following xa xb so this is the activity of neurons a and b given s which is stimulus whether that is true right pxa given stimulus pxb given stimulus right in which case right if the total correlation that you're seeing there emerges from the joint activity of a and b which is a marginal over the stimulus of this conditional xb given stimulus so in this distribution they can be correlated and you test it maybe they're significantly correlated but this correlation could come solely because you know the stimulus drives them in this conditional way and even if they're conditionally independent you know they can get correlated because of the stimulus so the question is really whether this guy factorizes in a way like if it factorizes like this right then there is sort of no like all correlation is is, is explained by inheriting the stimulus but if it doesn't correlate this in this way so for instance if to describe this conditional joint distribution you'd have to write you'd have to write down a model that looks like this one over 
in the language of our max n models that we talked about, uh, H A, which can depend on stimulus, plus H B, these are independent fields which can now depend on stimulus, but there's conditioning on it and Z depends on stimulus, X B plus J A B X A X B. So that means this doesn't factorize. These neurons are interacting even though you know I condition on the stimulus and so then that means that there is a part of correlation which is beyond what the stimulus can explain okay so you can construct this type of model that's called the stimulus dependent max n stimulus dependent max n and you can search for it if you want in the in the literature um, somewhat complicated and so people who are in the field in neuroscience they don't usually do that because for systems where you have perfect repeats, there is a much more simple mechanism to test for, for whether the neurons are correlated beyond what you'd expect by stimulus. So let me, let me say what that is. Okay. So you could do that and, you know, it's kind of cumbersome because the thing depends on the stimulus. But let me assume like in the retina, I have my neural rasters for neuron A and I have rasters for neuron B. Okay. But not only I have one response because I can display the same stimulus over and over. Okay, so I have multiple repetitions. So I have for neuron A, I have repetition one response, which is some zero, one, zero, one, one, I'm making it up. And for repetition two, there is of course something slightly similar, but not exactly the same because the neuron has a bit of a noise and for repetition three and so on. And similar for neuron B, right? I have repetition one, respond somehow differently and so on. And there is, right, there is other repetitions. So if I have stimulus repeats, then of course there is another nice shuffle I can do, right? To do a new hypothesis test for this excess correlation while I discount for this, right? So what I can do is at every time in, in, in the, right? So if this is a particular time in my stimulus and in my experiment, right? The time goes this way. So it's a particular time. And for every time I'll do that, I can randomly reshuffle the responses of neuron A across the repetitions. So I reshuffle these responses, okay? And for neuron B, I reshuffle its responses. So meaning here, I instead of putting a repetition, uh, the response at repetition one, I put repetition 17 and here I put repetition 36 and whatever, right? So what I have, a, if, I, if I do this type of shuffling at every time bin, what have I done? I'm keeping the average response of neuron A locked to the stimulus, right? So the average being an average across repetitions because I only reshuffle it. So the average stays the same, right? So the firing rate of neuron A stays the same. The firing rate of neuron B also stays the same. The firing rates are the same as in the original raster and they're locked to the stimulus. But what I have destroyed is correlations between A and B conditional on the stimulus. So both are locked to the stimulus, right? But here, if I now compute the correlation coefficients you know, so the part of correlation that's because the, that exists because they're both modulated by the stimulus is the same, but any extra part is destroyed, right? Because I now compute the correlation between the neuron A on repetition 17, because I did the shuffle with the, you know, neuron B at repetition 36, right? And so, and so on in many shuffles. So I can now, from these shuffled rasters, again, from, from shuffled, rasters, um, comp compute, I'll call it CAB tilde. So it's tilde because the, it's, it's another, it's not a, the, the original correlation, right? It's the correlation where the, the, the repetitions have been shuffled, okay? And so this is, this neuron, the, after the shuffling, the only correlation between A and B that remains is the correlation because of the common stimulus, because that's, that's still in the data, right? So this CAB is correl correlation due to common stimulus, but nothing more, right? And so now what, what is done traditionally in the field is to compare C, A, B tilde with the full correlation without the shuffling, C, A, B. And typically people define something that they call the noise correlation, which is a difference 
you know, CAB noise is the total correlation minus this one that's just due to the stimulus. And the question is, is the noise correlation, you know, significantly, uh, and this could be positive or negative, is it significantly above or below zero? And this is taken as an indication that, you know, it's not just due to the inherited stimulus, but it's, you know, there is some other interaction between the neuron that the stimulus doesn't, you know, account for. So that's a common, like that, statistically, that's a bit question, like that's actually a bit questionable. So why would you take the correlation difference and does the correlation difference matter and so on? I mean, this would be an actual probabilistic model that, you know, you can do all the tools of Bayesian statistics on. That's a particular empirical measure, but, you know, it's a common one. So that's why, that's why I, I, I write down here. But the last bit that, that I want to say before I, as, as we wrap up, is what if I, you know, in many cases, in also in neuroscience and so on, two things happen. So first of all, I don't have the perfect stimulus repeats. I mean, for retina, it's great. You know, I can show it six, six, 600 times the same movie and it happily looks at it 600 times. And you look, you show, you know, the cortex, the same things. Well, are they really the same? I mean, the thing is learning and this and that and it's modulating and, and so on, right? So I might not have perfect repeats. So what do I do then? And the second thing is, what if I want, what if I have in my mind a more complicated model where it's not only these two factors, right? So here is the stimulus, which I control from the outside and I can undo it via the repeats. And then there is some other, you know, putatively interesting correlation, but there is cases where the thing is more complicated. So what, how, like how do I then decide whether, you know, the two neurons are more coupled than I would expect based on common stimulus and so on? Okay, so I mean, the idea here is that you can use the maximum entropy models to do that. And let me just give you an example and you know, I can give you the reference if you're interested. Um, so this is something that we have done recently uh, on and the, the, the setup is hippocampus. And the setup is also freely behaving animal. So the animal runs around while it's being recorded from the brain. And of course, then you can have no stimulus repeats, right? I mean, the animal is doing whatever it wants to do. So there is no particular way to repeat anything. Um, <clears throat> and so, so, so what, what does one want to do is the following. Um, so here is a setup. So this is an arena. It's a circular arena, one meter. There is a mouse. And I guess that's the, I don't know, that's my mouse, right? It's running around some trajectory. Uh, you know, R of T. And uh, as it runs around in, in, in the hippocampus, uh, there is a set of cells, so, so CA1 neurons that really like to fire locked to space. So you, if you record from it, you will find a cell that really likes to be active and make spikes when, the, you know, when the rat is here. And when the rat is elsewhere, it doesn't do anything or it just fires at a very low rate. And there is another hippocampal neuron that, for instance, likes to fire when the rate right is here, okay. Um, so, and so on. So many neurons, they like different firing. And uh, again, you know, if we record from neuron A and neuron B, well, if this is A and this is B, then of course they will be somewhat correlated because when the rat is here, kind of both like to fire, right? So somehow that will lead to, to, to some sort of correlation. Uh, and again, we would like to know if A and B interact more than what you would expect because of this overlapping thing. <clears throat> but that's not all. So part of the confusion in interaction of A and B is because they're what, what is called place fields, like receptive fields, because these things overlap. But it's even more complicated. So in the hippocampus, so if these are two neurons, this is this common position of the animal that can be a confound. It's not the only confound. So it's very well known in hippocampus that you have global modulation, like you have rhythmic activity, right? You have various neural oscillations as it is called, and neurons like to fire locked to those global oscillations and they like to synchronously fire as a global population, right? So you can imagine there is sort of a global, some global signal. It's not the position itself. It's some other, you know, pacemaker or rhythmic thing or so on that also co-modulates A and B uh, and can make them fire more than we would expect, right? So in a sense, 
what, what you'd like is a way to statistically test for excess correlation between these two guys while discounting for various other factors like this one and this one and so on. Okay, so um, in, in the way in which we approach this problem in, in, in hippocampus is that as a proxy for this synchronous, uh, for this signal, you can actually, if you record from many neurons, you can actually use the, and there is good reasons to do that, that I don't have time to go into. Uh, you can actually use that synchrony, right? So you look at, you record from hundreds of neurons. And if you just take the global variable, which is this K as we had it there, that's a good proxy for both oscillatory activity and for modulation because of velocity and so on that I'm not talking about here, but it's a kind of global activity pattern, right? Of, of all the neurons together. And what now I want to do is I want to create a maximum entropy model for my population of neurons. So I want PX1, you know, XN, and two of these ones are my special neurons say and B somewhere inside. I'll, I want to ask whether they're correlated somewhere among them are, are these two. So I want these to be max N, let's say, which, uh, exactly reproduces the following variables, xi as a function of r and the synchrony. Okay, so I want a model that's as random as possible, but correctly reproduces the activity of, like the mean activity of every neuron given its position. That's this guy, right? This place field, as it's called, right? For each, for each of the neurons, you exactly reproduce where each individual likes to fire, and you exactly reproduce how it's modulated by this global co-activation of activity, which is this K variable, right? And so after you have this joint distribution that accounts for the marginal activities and for the global synchrony, right? You can now, this is a full joint distribution, right? So I can now ask this joint distribution for my two neurons of interest, A, a, uh, a and B to predict a very non-trivial null distribution. What would I expect to observe for this particular statistic, the correlation of A and B, right? And, you know, this is a distribution because my model is a joint distribution. So it will give me a expected correlation between A and B due to the fact that the marginal responses of the cells are like this, and this is how they're modulated by joint activity. And then I can go into the data empirically and measure the real correlation between A and B. And, you know, it will fall somewhere within this distribution. It turns out that in this type of model in, in hippocampus, 95% of pairs of cells fall within the body of the distribution. But there are neurons that you can find, neural pairs that you find that are correlated way more or way less than what's predicted by this neural model, right? And for us, those pairs are then the pairs that we can focus on. So they somehow there needs to be to explain their joint behavior. There needs to be something, right? Which is not just shared place and shared synchrony. And, you know, it's a non-trivial null model because it's, it's a joint model, right? This K variable, collective variable couples all of them together. Okay, so it's really a large population effect. It's not a, just a pairwise thing. You compare, you predict pairwise statistic and compare it against the data but the whole model is a joint model for the full simultaneously recorded population, right? And so you see, this is slightly different. You know, here I could make an even crazier model, a max sense model, which constrains all the marginals and in addition constrains all the pairs X, I, X, J, right? That would be a full model. That's what we did in the, in the retina for the neurons. And then I could look at, in, I could introspect into the model. There would be a JIJ term, right? The coupling between the two neurons. And I could say, is it large, is it small? And use that as, a, as an indication of whether things are strongly interacting or not. But technically constructing this model is very hard. Whereas constructing this model is not hard at all. Turns out oh, it's not easy, but it's not that hard. And then using it as a null model to test against the data is actually also something that you can do. So this is what I wanted to, you know, you have these two alternative models. Either you build a full scale model that precisely reproduces all the pairs and so on and try to learn from it, or you use a simpler maxn model as a null model and then test the data against it, 
right? It's a different, same thing, but it's a different take on the problem. All right, so since I went a little bit over time, let me, let me end here. And tomorrow we do something very different. The last lecture will be about more statistical, more theoretical. It will be about, still with slides though, it will be about connecting maximum entropy distributions as priors in Bayesian inference. So it will be really kind of inference oriented. And this is more data analysis oriented now. All right, so thanks and sorry for get going a bit over time. Yes, there is some. Oh, oh no, it's just comments, so it's fine. Okay. So do, do we stop? Have to stop the recording. Uh, stop. Oh wait, not uh, this, right? Yes. Yeah.